if you're prepared to have Bible study, let me tell you how you study the Bible. You say, well, I already know how to study the Bible. <laughs> Maybe. Because the key to studying the Bible is the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit. By that I mean, if you believe that Christ died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead the third day, Paul called it the gospel in 1 Corinthians 15. The moment you believe because you live in the church age, that period between the first coming of Christ and the second coming of Christ, you are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. He's the great teacher of the word of God. In John 14, 26, Jesus said when he comes, he will indwell you and he will teach and recall the word of God that you've studied. That's a powerful idea. Here's what hinders the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the teaching hour. Personal sin. It could be mental attitude type of sins or sins of the tongue or overt sins. If you're, if you're aware, your conscience or the conviction of the Holy Spirit of any sin unconfessed, you should confess that in silence and privacy through your priesthood before you study the Bible. That goes also to the application of the Bible to your life. It should be done by the ministry of the Spirit and not by the flesh. Now, what do I do? Well, you have to confess your sin because you're carnal. Personal sin produces carnality. You're not walking in the Spirit, you're walking in the flesh. To get out of walking in the flesh and back into the ministry of the Holy Spirit who still lives inside you. John 14, 16, he's not permitted to leave. He's there forever. You have to confess your sin. You have to do it in silence and privacy. You have to do it to the Lord. 1 John 1, 9 says, If I confess my sin, he's faithful and just to forgive me and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. It's a pretty powerful idea, isn't it? What a wonderful promise that is. So I'm going to give you a moment of silence as a believer priest. Necessary. So I ask every head to be bowed and every eye closed to offer you privacy. And for you to deal with your own issues in your life, if you need to confess sin, confess it. If you're what we would maybe say, if you are confessed up, then pray the Holy Spirit would teach you some great truths today that would change your life, not only in time, but for eternity. Life changing experiences through the word of God. Jesus said, you'll know the truth and truth sets you free. And so our father, we thank you today for these that have come our way to study with us. As we open, close one month and are looking to open a, a new one this week. The, the month that's coming is the month of Thanksgiving. And may we have every day something to be thankful for to you in our hearts as we go through that month, looking to the birth of Christ in December. I pray today, Father, the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of the word of God to our soul, and that we would embrace it in order to give us the liberty to know the truth that sets us free. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you have a study guide, we're in a recent, we've been in a study a pretty, a pretty good while, starting with the book of Genesis. We are now in uh, the book of Genesis. We're now in the second chapter. But notice on your paper, I'm looking at Matthew 24, 35. So, if you would, if you, there's a Bible in front of you, you can well take that and look at it yourself, or you can read the top line on your paper. The Bible is the only eternal book of world history. And you think about that. If you was to put all the writings of really good expert kind of people on world history, you would fill the libraries of the world. And when you got through reading them, they wouldn't have the whole story told. They would only have part of it. The part that they lived in. The rest of it, they would depend on somebody else for information. Those who lived a thousand years ago, <laughs> you know, what do we know? They only wrote about their thousand years ago when they lived. And what little bit they knew prior. Well, when you study the Bible, the book of Genesis opens up. And it explains from Genesis to Revelation, world history and mankind's role in it, and especially the believer's role in it. The believer's role in biblical history. That's the importance of the church. You will find, for example, 
the first 11 chapters of, Gen of Genesis aren't even recorded in what we call human history. There's a whole, in fact, there's a, there are several great things that happened that there's no record of in human history, and when they can't find it, they think it never existed. The truth of the matter is it did exist, and the only place you can find it is in the Word of God. Genesis 2, chap chapter 1 through chapter 11. There's no biblical history on it except in the Bible. There's no human history except in the Bible. If you want to know what it was really like, how the earth and the world and everything came into existence, you have to read those 11 chapters. So we've been doing that. It's very important that we do it uh, here in Moody, and so that's what we're doing. Now listen to what Jesus spoke about this very thing. Here it is on top of your paper. He said that heaven and earth will pass away. They're going to pass away. The heaven and earth that you know about when you look up into the skies and see the heavens and the earth on which you live, the earth that you walk on, you, you were born on, you will die on, that earth will pass away. Right. Listen to what else he said. But my word, that is the word of God, but my word shall not pass away. It'll never pass away. The Bible will never pass away. It's, it's the eternal book in the library of heaven. You get to heaven, this book you're going to read, so you might as well start ahead. Right? You might as well get ahead of the course. He said, but of that day, the day when the earth, the day when the heavens of the earth would pass away, but of that day and hour when they would pass away, no one knows, even the angels of heaven, nor the Son of God from heaven, but the Father alone. You got that? So we're studying that. Now, Jesus made the previous statement, Matthew 24, 35, made the previous statement while answering a question of his disciples. In verse 30, they ask him, tell us when will these things happen and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? People still ask that. <laughs> now, the difference is the disciples thought that the coming of Jesus, based on old covenant thinking, was one event. That when he would come, he would establish his kingdom and the kingdom would go on. But that wasn't the way God had planned. What God had planned, that Jesus, he would die on a cross, he would be buried, and on the third day raised from the dead. Forty days later, he would ascend back to the Father to be seated at the right hand of God the Father in the third heaven. The first heaven is atmosphere of the earth where birds and planes fly. The second is space, what we call space, and the third is the throne room of God. When a believer dies, that's where he goes. Second Corinthians, the 12th chapter, Paul talks about that experience, that he went to the third heaven. He was not permitted to give details from it. And therefore, he was given a thorn in the flesh not to give out details of it. A reminder. So, on your paper, you're going to see nine periods of world history that are really important. I'm going to cover the first five this morning and the next five because we have a mission report uh, out of Africa with Rick who just got back. Next week, I'm going to cover the last five. Now, here's what's amazing to me. People do not know about how the world came into existence 
before Genesis. Because when you, listen, when you, a lot of people don't know this, but you should. When Moses wrote the book of Genesis, he wrote it in two manuscripts. One manuscript was handed to him, and the second one he wrote about. I've gone through great lengths to teach you that, okay? From Genesis 2-4 to the end of the book are 11 Toledos. Moses wrote those in Toledos. There are sections of human history that are important to be known, which covers the whole, the whole rest of the book of Genesis. The first manuscript, that was handed to him is Genesis 1, 1 through 3. There was a world that existed before heaven and earth, that as we know it, the earth that we know it. There was a whole world that existed. We are told that in Genesis 1, 1 through 3. We have studied that. Last time that we met, we studied the original, what's on your paper, the first one, original creation, what I'm going to talk a little more about because people don't, don't understand a thing about it, and they should. There's, a, there's plenty of writing in the Bible on the original heaven and earth. In the beginning, right? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That was before Genesis 1-3 when he restored the heavens and the earth. We've studied that. You can go back and you can, you can pick up all of our studies off from our website, our church website. You just look for the Genesis uh, account. <laughs> well, let me tell you, last time we talked about several things about original grit. In other words, what was the world before the, before the human population of the earth. Because, see, when we get in Genesis 1-3, we're getting ready to put uh, mankind and animals and fish and birds and, uh, on earth. See, that's the story of what you call the story of creation. is actually the story of restoration of creation. Creation began in 1-1, but something happened in 2 that caused it to have to be restored. Now, I've done, long, I've done long studies on this, so I'm just into review, and I feel bad for those who are just visiting. I'm giving you a lot of information. I spent hours on this, documenting it from the Word of God. Now, we studied and we looked. If you would go, and on your paper I wrote it down, if you would go back and you would study Isaiah, wrote the scriptures down, Ezekiel 28, and read those scriptures down, and Revelation 12, and I wrote those scriptures down, and look for a life and a world that existed before what we know as the, as the heaven and earth you and I live on, the human race has lived on for all these centuries. And you would find some marvelous things talked about. God talks, get descriptions of what the life was back then. And the last time we gathered, I talked about many of those things. I want you, now you're going to have to write these down because they're not on your paper, but I got, to, I got to thinking about that because I've had so many people say to me, I had no idea there's a world existed before the world we live in. Well, where do you think God came from and what do you think he was doing during this time before we came in? And so there's a lot of interest in that. So I'm going to give you a few additional things that occurred in the original creation the world that God lived in before the world we live in, all right? So here's the first thing. This is a wonderful thing. I'm a farm boy, so this is of great importance to me. A concept of the seed. The concept of the seed was designed at the Eternal Life Conference, which we've talked about, a conference that was held in eternity past, where God laid out his plan to the angels. And one of the angels revolted against that plan because he wanted to be the centerpiece of it. And God said, no, my son is going to be the centerpiece of it. 
and he led a revolt against the Supreme Council. You can read that in Isaiah 14. You can read about that in Ezekiel 28. You can read about that in Revelation 12. One of the things that we discover when we get into the human history part of this, that there was a concept of the seed. And the concept of the seed was magnificent. This is something man could have never thought up that God only his genius could have. Life in the seed. Whatever the DNA of the seed is for what it's supposed to produce, God put it in it. He put it in flowers and they produce not only a flower, but a specific kind of flower. Put it in birds, they, you know, species, which we talked about. And whatever the DNA is, it's not just of a bird, but of a specific bird. A difference between a sparrow and a pigeon and uh, go, go eagles, you know, and an eagle. So the seed comes, not only that, not only is it in plants and fish and, and animals and birds and all that, it's a seed concept, but he put it in the human race. When, you, when people refer to their ancestry, the Bible refers to it as a seed. For example, go to Galatians with me. And let me show you the concept in this most, most supreme point. In Galatians, the third chapter, this is not on your paper now. If you want it on your paper, you're going to have to write it on your paper. In Galatians 3.16, now the promises were spoken to Abraham. That's chapter 12 of, of Genesis. Now the promise was spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He does not say and to seeds, plural, but referring, as referring to many. He's talking about ancestries now, seed of ancestry. But rather to one and to your seed, that is Christ. At the eternal life conference in eternity past, when God set down the plan of God, as we call it, the centerpiece of his plan was Christ. The seed was Christ. In the human race, the seed, the redemptive seed was going to be Christ. Later, in the book of Matthew and Luke, as, as, Luke, as Luke and Matthew opened their, this subject up, they refer to that as Jesus Christ. You will call, in Matthew 1, 20 through 23, you will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. The human race. Right? Yes, of course. Look. Do you see this concept of seed? That's my point in it. Do you see the concept of seed? It says, and he says, he, and, and to Abraham, he wasn't talking to all of his ancestry, but rather to one lineage of it. And of course, Jesus came from Judah through David. You know, you know that. Okay? So that's important. Look, where was this, where was this whole idea of seed developed in eternity past? So that when we get to Genesis 1-3, we've got plants, we've got fish, we've got birds, we've got animals, we got yada yada. And it's all about the seed. When my family from out, out of Virginia was home, we were eating muskmelon and watermelon. That was the season. Cantaloupe to you. Cantaloupe and watermelon. And my eight-year-old grandson wanted to gather up. Grandpa, if I gathered all that up and planted them, could we get watermelon and, and cantaloupe? What would you tell them? Yes. Of course you can. You know why? Because the life of a watermelon is in the DNA of the seed, and the life of a cantaloupe is in his DNC, DNA. C, DNA. Right? You plant it, you get it. I mean, I, we knew that as farm boy. We knew what the seed would, you know, we hoped that we had the right seed when we planted that we, you know, whatever seed we planted was going to get, whether we knew what it was or not, right? Okay. 
where did that concept come from so that when when we began to do crea the, the restoration creation story of Genesis 3, you know, day one, day two, day three, day four, everything is just moving according to the plan, right? Boom, 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 boom. It's, it's going down there. And where did that, where did that come from? What came from an eternity past? There was a, and that's, that, that's just one of many marvelous ideas. For example, where did the whole idea of redemption come from? Where did that idea come from? Where, where did that whole idea come from? See? And, and so it is. I mean, do you understand how important the Word of God is to your life? The, the, the questions, the, the, the many questions you have of life are found in the Bible with wonderful answers to your life. You're struggling with things you don't need to struggle with if you're looking for answers. They're in the Word of God. If you come to this church, you'll get it. It, it'll take me a while. You have to devote your life to a year with me. I'll get you answers to these things. We will study the Bible together and get our answers. Well, they're all there. So that's one thing. Where was this whole seed idea developed so that when it came time to plant and, and raise, we could get it? Yeah, there you go. In eternity past. The life of a human, the life of a species, the life of a plant life, where did that come from? It came from a seed concept that God developed in eternity past. Here's another thing. Angels were developed, right? You have God, you have a heaven and an earth, and God, and God creates angels. We know how he created man, agreed? How, how, did, how did God create man? Out of the dust of the earth. How did he create woman? Man's rib, right? How did he create angels? <laughs> he was out of his mind. No, I don't. You know, you're driving me out of my mind. Listen, listen to me. Light. Create him out of light. First John 1 5. God is light, and in him there's no darkness. When you read Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28, Revelation 12, you're going to learn something wonderful. That angels, angels are called the, mor the, the, the morning star and the sun of dawn. And what they really hate, a true angel hates darkness. A fallen angel, that's the only thing he has. Fallen angels have to live in darkness. They cannot live in light. I'm talking about the light of God. I'm not talking about the light of stars. and the, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a light that is beyond that. Isn't it interesting that when you get to Revelation and you begin to look at the churches, now listen to me, Moody. Do you know that every church is assigned an angel? Did you know that? Well, listen. Go back and read the seven churches of Asia Minor. Everyone begins with the angel of the church. Some say, well, that's the pastor. Mm. Stay with me a year and you'll know that's not <laughs> the angel of the church. You know the wonderful thing, and you know what he's responsible for? To give God reports. Oh, if you read each of the seven churches, you'll find that, they, they had, that God has a report on all of us. He, when he gets the report and he reads it, he states to the church, I know what you've been up to. <laughs> Good and bad. Isn't that interesting? How come you've read that and never, never studied it? See, a lot of times you read the Bible and don't study it. You should study the Bible under the ministry of the Holy Spirit. He will teach you such things as you've never known. And there's one of them. Did you know that? Did you know that? And the... 
And the devil was once an angel of light. He fell from grace, from his the whole operation of the concept of grace. He fell, led a revolt against God, and became the angel of darkness. Do you know that? Yeah. You should read the church, seven churches of Asia Minor and look for where how God has established the system for it. Listen, we have an angel over us, outside of us. We have an angel. That's God has a hedge around us to protect us in the angelic conflict, the war against Satan. You do know there's a war against Satan, don't you? Well, if you don't, you're already a victim. There's a real war. It's an invisible war. One that you can know about and how you can fight in it. Write this down. Ephesians 6 tells you to put on the full armor of God because you fight in an angelic conflict. You fight in an angelic warfare. And he describes it. Paul describes it. A war. We're in a war already. Every day we get up in a war. The church is at war with the devil and his angels. Because the devil knows when he rebelled in eternity past, the original creation thing, when, when he rebelled in, in, in uh, Matthew 25, 41, he was, put, he was judged and sentenced to the lake of fire. He's got to run his course, but he knows what his end is. And you read the, if you read the book of Revelation, the 20th chapter, you will see what his end is. It's the fulfillment of Matthew 25, 41, which occurred in eternity past. Eternity past, which is number one on your paper. I, 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 I don't know. I find this stuff interesting uh, to me. So we have an angel on the outside of us in the sense of, a uh, reporter, he's, he's the reporter for the Heaven Gazette, making reports on us of how we're doing. Do we have a demon angel assigned to us? I don't know how the devil runs that whole deal. He just, he just wages war against us. All right? I don't know about that. I suppose it depends on how important you are, where you would fall in the scheme of whether or not be a principality of power or whatever. I don't want to get off my don't want to get off my subject though. What do we have? That, so we have an angel assigned to the outer periphery of our church. Do you understand that? Well, just read the seven churches of Asia Minor and you'll, you'll get that. What do we have inside the church? Watch this now. What protection do we have from inside the church? The Holy Spirit of God who indwells every church age believer from the point of salvation on. Whether you know it or not, he's there. He, ought to, he shouldn't be a guest. He should be a resident. All right? So, so I, I, I find these kind of things interesting to me. And so I'm talking about things that were established in eternity past in a world that existed before the world you and I know. That's number one. In number two, we talk, and we talked about this last week. In number two, we talked about this. Number two, the fall of Satan from eternity past. When you read, listen to me now, when you read Genesis 1 2, you have a, a world existence that's not 1 1. <laughs> well, guys, let's just take a look at it. I know. I know. You got your Bible? Look at it. Either look it up on your Bible or your cell phone. <laughs> Put your eyes on it. Put your eyes on the Word of God because the Word of God will put its eyes on you. The earth, listen, in the beginning God created heavens and earth. That's one. Two. The, remember, this is the first manuscript. This is the original manuscript. And the earth was formless and void. That's tohu wabohu in the Hebrew. And darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God, Holy Spirit, was hovering over the surface of the waters. And that was a state the earth was in before Genesis 1-3.
that waters. What we're going to have in day one, two, and three is a resolution to two. We're going to have light over, overtake darkness. The waters are going to be separated from above and below, and those waters are going to be used in Noah's flood when you get to six through nine. We've studied all this. I'm just doing a review from last time. You see, like, like day one, you should read day one, day two, and day three for sure to get all that information. And I wrote all the scriptures down for you. How do we know that we have an angelic conflict today? Well, we know it because we've read of the fall of Satan. The fall of Satan. What we're dealing with, what Paul is dealing with in Ephesians, the sixth chapter, is the devil and the fallen angels. When he rebelled against God in eternity past, he led a third of the angels in revolt against God and his eternal plan. And he's still fighting it. And he's fighting for his life all the way to the end. And the church of Jesus Christ is the buffer zone. You have got to know it, and you've got to get serious about this. We're in the fight of our life. I mean, one thing is to talk about how bad the economy is and how high the prices are and all that. Listen, that pales in comparison with the angelic conflict, what's going on. The, the battles that are being fought and lost by the church are phenomenal. The church of Jesus Christ has become, has to become serious students of the word of God. When you read the put on the full armor of God in Ephesians 6, there's only one offensive weapon in it. All the others are defensive. It is the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. The sword of the Holy Spirit working through the word of God. And buddy, you better get serious about this because it, it's not the economy we're fighting. We're fighting the forces of darkness. And the church is the only buffer. The church of Jesus Christ. Listen, when you read Paul's writings on the church, the church that houses the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the world restrains evil. It's the only restrainer of evil. And when he's removed by the rapture, all hell will break out on earth. It's called the tribulation. Well, so let's take a look at today. Let's take a look at today. When we get to Genesis 1, 3 through the second chapter, verse 7, we're in a period called the restoration of the earth. A restoration of the earth. Six days of creation, seventh day of rest. On the seventh day, Moses established a Sabbath system of a week, a year, 50 years, jubilee, a whole Sabbath system of shadow Christology. Write this down, Hebrews 10.1. You say, I've never heard of shadow Christology. Well, you should... It's, it's a biblical concept. It talks about a sh the shadow. The sh that shadow Christology. Now, the Sabbath system was a whole system that, like all the law, Galatians 3.24, is to point you to Christ. The purpose of the law was to point you to Christ. You couldn't keep it, therefore you needed a Savior. The law condemns you. The curse of the law, you were under the curse of the law. The law condemns you. It's cursed. And you had to be redeemed from it. That's, that's Paul in the book of Galatians. That's his book on it. <clears throat> so you, you should be mindful of that. Here's what happens to the Sabbath system. The entire Sabbath system. Mark 2.27. How is it possible you've not read that when that's the solution to the Sabbath system? Because Jesus fulfilled it. 
He fulfilled the entire, because he's the fulfiller of shadow Christology. In Mark, in Mark 2.27, we're told that what is declared in Genesis 2.3 is the first messianic prophecy. The Sabbath was the first messianic prophecy of Christ. How do I know it? Mark 2.27. Well, I tell you, I don't mind reading it. I'm not going to get through today anyhow. So, 227. Jesus said to them, the Sabbath, notice that's a capital S. He's talking about a Sabbath system. That's a mosaic Sabbath system. The Sabbath was made for, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. So that the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. You know why? Because he fulfilled it. He's the Lord of the Sabbath because he fulfilled it. <clears throat> well, anyhow. In Genesis 2, 4 through 6, and we'll, we'll get, eventually get back to Genesis we were given a brief tour prior to the Garden of Eden in the first Toledoth, when you read Genesis 2, 4 through 6. Then, when you read verse 7, we have the forming of the body of the human race. It is formed from the earth that's been restored. Now listen to me. What, what had to be restored in order for God to say, I can take from the dust and form man? The earth had to be restored. Right? What was it like? It was like, it was like one, two. If you read one, two, that's the description of the earth, right? The earth was out form without void, the darkness covered it up, yada, yada, yada. So what we got going down now is a restoration of the earth. Now write this down because some of your visitors, Isaiah 45, 18 says that when the earth was in the state of Genesis 1, 2, it was not inhabitable. Well, you could understand that just by reading that. And so the earth has to be restored in order to put man on the earth and for man to come from it. And so God did that. <clears throat> Look, I know, I hear this all the time. I have never heard anything in my life like this, and I've been in church all my life. I know, I, I can't explain that. I can only explain why I do it. There it is in the Bible. I just teach it. I don't know why others don't. I just know why I do. Okay? So it, 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 it doesn't do any good to me to, you know, for you to tell me all that because I know it. I've heard it so many times. Now listen to me. In Genesis 2-7, what is made? The body, right? The human body. Adam, Adam's is his body. Listen to me now. Here's what you missed. But in chapter 1, 26, his soul was made. His soul was made prior to his body so that God could put it in his body once his body was created. His soul was created on day six in Genesis 1.26. Well, look. He, God says, I'm going to make man. How? In my image, according to our likeness. I'm going to make man in our image, according to our likeness. Who's, who's the us and ours? It's the God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. We're going to make the Son in the image of the other two members of the Godhead, what you call the Trinity, <clears throat> which is okay with me. I don't have a problem with that. You see, what came first, right? What came first? God created the soul ready to put it in a body. Genesis 1.26 compared with Genesis 2.7. Nisha Mahaim, 
Nisha Mahaim. I, God says, I will breathe into his nostrils the breath of lives. It's plural. It ends in an I am in Hebrew. It makes it plural. I know I, <laughs> this might be a whole lot to digest. But listen to me. It's Genesis and it's 101. Right? I mean, this is kindergarten. This is Genesis. This is not Matthew, Mark. This is not heavy stuff. This is just, the, we're just rolling down the pike. This is stuff you've heard, you know, growing up in the church and talking about the creation story and having a little picture of Adam and Eve, you know, with figs, fig leaves and things like that. Poison ivy. I don't know which one it was. Here's one of them. Number four, we're in the garden. Listen, listen. See your little paper, original creation. See the fall of Satan, corrupts the earth. You ought to write the word change. Big changes occurred. Agreed? Yeah, big changes. <laughs> now we're in the restoration of the earth, and there's going to be some big changes made, right? Big changes made. We're going to go to the Garden of Eden. Number four, the fourth period is Garden of Eden, Genesis 2, 8 through the third chapter, verse 24. It is in this period of world history. Adam was given one command with consequences attached. It's Genesis 2, 17. Don't eat of the tree. In the day you eat dying, you will die. He's talking about two types of death. And we'll eventually get there and we'll teach this. I'm, this is just kind of, I've paused for a moment uh, to, just to talk about some things that I can only cover in an hour. So I, Adam's trans, transgressed this command. He, trans, he violated the command and judgment was passed on to all mankind. You know, like, that's not fair. Well, I don't know. He set it up in eternity past. So, you know, it's fair. How do I know that? Well, look, he says, if you eat of the tree, die, and you will die. You say, yeah, but how do you get that passed on to human race? Here it is. You ready? Romans 5, 12. Wherefore is by one man, Adam, sin into the world and death by sin. And so death, sin, death spread upon all mankind. There it is. You should read it all the way to verse 21. You know, here's what I hear from people who come to church with me. You give us way too much homework. I don't know. I just tell it to you. I write it down and hopefully it's homework. It will help you get out of a slump you're in in your life. I can tell you that. The word of God is... Powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword, pierced into the dividing of the soul and spirit and the joints and the marrows and becomes a critic of the thoughts and intents of the human heart. Hebrews 4.12. Why should you not study the Bible? It's the only book you can read in your life every day that will touch the core of who you are in your heart. Bring peace and confidence in your walk. It is in the period of the Garden of Eden that we find a second Messianic prophecy given. It's Genesis 3.15, dealing with the woman and her seed. In Romans, the 16th chapter, verse 20, Paul said that the seed of the woman is the victor of the mess of Genesis 3.15. When you read Genesis 3.15, you have the angelic conflict, the war between God and Satan. It's now boiled down to the woman's seed and his seed. The woman's seed and his seed. See, we're back to that seed concept again. You should read all this. And he tells us that Christ is the victory in the angelic conflict. Christ is the only way you can have victory in the angelic conflict. Christ. I'll tell you, the devil is afraid of Christ more than anything in the world. Yeah. 
So Genesis 3.15, Paul explains it in Romans 16.20. Victory in the angelic conflict in Christ. The earth was also put under a curse in this period through Adam's sin. The earth, see, people don't understand the earth is under a curse. It's wearing out. The heavens and the earth, the heavens that we, planes fly in, is under a curse. The heavens and the earth is under a curse. This, look, this is what global warming, these people are nuts about it, but this is why it's going on. It's been going on since Adam sinned in the garden. And it's going to continue to go like trees wear out, flowers, you know, everything is under this curse. Everything on the earth is under this curse. That's why people go like, well, look at global warming. Yes, yeah, they have, a, they have an argument, but what's the cause? That's where we lose them. Yes, there's no doubt there is. The earth is wearing out and so is the heavens. One day they're going to be all rolled up and wrapped out and put away. How do I know it? Because Jesus said the heavens and earth will pass away. When it, when the, in the second coming, boom, it'll happen one day. But listen, it's in a down spiral. A, the earth is wearing out just like everything else. Got a pair of shoes? Yeah, you know, everything wears out, right? Your wife's telling you, you need to get a new pair of underwear. And you're like, nah, these are good. I've had them since high school. I just got them broke in. You know, I think they're broke out. The earth is put under this curse. And well, listen, it won't, they'll have that curse all the way to the millennial age, that thousand year reign. And the earth will be released from that curse. Isn't that interesting? For a thousand years, it, it will not have that curse. For a thousand years, it won't have Satan either. And then he will be released and start his foolishness again. Adam and Eve, reason I went to 324, Adam and Eve had this marvelous paradise to live in and got expelled from it because of their transgression. You know why? Because in that garden was the tree of life. And they now were not able to participate with it. You will find that tree again in Revelation 21, 22, if you're interested. Of course, that would require you to read a little bit. And that would be a good thing. I'm going to close our session today with the antediluvian world. I'm now in Genesis 4 through 11. I'm in the antediluvian world. I'm in the world from the fall of Adam in Genesis 3. I'm now in the, I'm in the period from the fall of Adam to the end of a period of human history called Noah's Flood, which was a worldwide flood upon the earth. It's going to destroy every human being except eight who are on the Ark of the Covenant, uh, the Ark of the, the Boat. Not the Ark of the Covenant, but the, the Boat. And who's on that boat? The Messianic Seed, the Messianic Seed of Seth. Genesis 5. You want to read who these are? The Messianic seed? You can read about it in Luke too. Luke, the third chapter, gives the genealogy. Seth through Noah, the, the Sethite family, Noah, the last of ten generations from the fall of Adam to the flood. After the flood, they will no longer be Sethites, they will be Shemites based on one of the sons of Noah that's going to carry the Messianic seed. Right, we have a problem that brings the flood. That is the the seed of of uh, the 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 seed of Satan against the seed of the woman. Right, this and this the seed of Satan is going to be described as the Nephilims. The Nephilims. You're going to read about the Nephilims, and they're going to cause. God to judge the rest of the world because they polluted, they corrupted the Messianic seed with the exception of eight people. Four couples. The rest of the, the, rest of the earth was polluted. To, and it was an attempt to destroy the Messianic seed, the seed of Christ. I'm sorry? 
Genesis 6 through 9. All right, I gave you Genesis 3, I gave you Galatians 3, I gave you Ephesians, a good, a good passage, that Ephesians 5, 8 through 17, 1 John 5, 4 through 5. These are passages worth your read. I, I don't have time to read them. I put them down there for you to read. The Noahic worldwide flood brought changes, so there ought to be a word up there above by them, changes. Look, and we're going to study this in detail when I get back to it. It originally... The antediluvian world had four rivers and three continents. When you read that, you want to pay attention to the waters that flowed around. And you will see that. The change is going to come with Noah's flood. We're going to have seven continents, many oceans, many seas, and a whole lot of rivers. So there's going, to be, there's going to be changes in Noah's flood. There's going to be changes to the, to the geographics of the earth. And we call that the post-Diluvian period. You and I live in the post-Diluvian period. From the time of Noah's flood to the time of the birth of Christ, the rapture of the church, the second coming of Christ, we are in that period where we're going to look for the post-Diluvian, we're going to look for the coming of Christ during our, our, our period of human history. Christ came, died on a cross, was buried, ascended back to the Father. The church is the dynamic force for God in the world. When Jesus comes back in what's known as the rapture, he's going to lift the church out, which is the great restrainer along with the Holy Spirit, is the great restrainer of evil. Not just the church, but the church that lives by the power of the Holy Spirit. And we go into a tribulation period. We're back in the Jewish age. The last seven years of Daniel. Daniel's seventieth year. Daniel's ninth chapter or such. Well, anyhow, you can you whatever's left there, you got. Let's close in a word of prayer. Father, we're thankful for these that have come our way, as we mentioned, and I know we have given a lot of information. Some of these are single points that should be a whole hour of study. But those who are really interested can pick it up off the website and study it in more detail. But it's the Word of God that's in repetition. Like any good student, it's the repetition that builds confidence into the system of faith. I pray, Father, today that we be wise stewards of this offering. Spend a little on ourselves and a lot on reaching the rest of the world with the gospel of Christ. In his name we've prayed. Amen.